Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. The design of the removable partial denture is too often relegated to the laboratory and the laboratory man. He doesn't know the oral conditions that exist and uh, will not do an adequate job of, of relaying that type of information into the potential design for the removable partial denture. This aspect should be performed by the dentist. In this situation, the class two removable partial denture situation. I term it class two because we will not be replacing the molar on this side. The occlusion in the maxillary arch is stabilized with the dentition on this side, so there is no need to make it a double free end saddle. So when we have the the edentulous situation on the a unilat in the unilateral situation, it's a class two uh, design. Now the basic problems uh, that we're fr confronted with are this. We have the potential support area, the edentulous ridge for the partial, and we have two abutments which we will go are going to need for distribution of forces and for retention. Now as the base is on movable tissue and we are potentially going to have two occlusal rests in these areas, primary occlusal rests, the base is going to rotate slightly into the tissue on the edentulous side. Therefore, the framework, the framework uh, is going to have to move slightly also. And in a class two situation, it is extremely difficult to accommodate to that movement. The, uh, the primary abutments, as we mentioned, will have a, an occlusal rest on the distal, will have reciprocating surfaces on the lingual, opposing the buccal retention. Another area in the design uh, that we want to uh, incorporate is an indirect retainer. This helps to dissipate the forces uh, somewhat. An indirect retainer is best placed the furthest from the rotation line and the potential rotation line will be the distal rests of the terminal abutment teeth. And the point most logical to accept a rest then in this situation is this area on the bicuspid. Now, looking at this case specifically, we can either draw the design directly onto the surveyed master cast or onto another cast. Now, I have drawn the final product on an additional cast and I'm going to uh, go over the specific design for this case and discuss some of the elements that uh, have led me to this final design. Now, first of all, I'm going to mention the red areas, the occlusal rests. Now, this occlusal rest should be approximately in the center of the tooth and the occlusal aspects of that tooth, uh, sort of over the middle part of the ridge. That's one of the most desirable places for it. Now, the other aspect of this uh, primary abutment retainer would be the retentive clasp. The retentive clasp, the retentive area of the retentive clasp is the center of the tooth, and this part of the portion of the clasp should be probably slightly away from the tooth and we can do that by our block out in the final block out of the master cast. But we notice that we'll try to bring the uh, retention off a little bit low, lower than the occlusal rest height. You see the occlusal rest height is up here. So that uh, if we have to grind the occlusal rest, and in this case we're going to incorporate a retentive wire, a wrought wire for this case, 
on the abutment tooth. We could use a cast uh, clasp, but we feel that the wrought wire, when designed correctly, will have more of a stress breaking uh, action to it. Uh, when you use the wrought wire, if it comes up off high, it will weaken the rest. So we try to keep that wrought wire coming off a little lower than the occlusal rest. The reciprocal area for the the reciprocal area for that retentive clasp is on the lingual aspect. In here I have a solid portion of the framework. There, there would be an intimate contact on the parallel surface in this area. Now I made this solid because if we look at the overall aspect of the potential major connector, you see I've chosen a lingual plate as opposed to just a lingual bar connecting the basic components of the partial because on the oral examination I found that there was very little room between the movable area of the base of the tongue to the to the free gingival margin. Now in the if you're going to place a lingual bar in this position, the lingual bar would be about this thick from this from here to the cingulum area. It would allow no no uh, uh, clearance at the free gingival margin, and and uh, food material would probably impact at that area. So in this case, where we cannot give a clearance from the superior surface of the lingual bar to the free gingival mar margin of three millimeter minimum, we should probably just cover that area with a lingual plate. If I made the bar very thin, the, portion, the partial denture would be too flexible in the midline. So this is the reason we would then cover this entire area with a lingual plate. Now, going on with that idea of the lingual plate, we connect the lingual plate from the indirect retainer, and this is the potential indirect retainer area here, the mesial surface of that bicuspid tooth. It is actually between the mesial surface and the distal surface of the uh, cuspid area, but the cuspid has a sloping surface and doesn't have a positive seat for that secondary rest of the indirect retainer. So we would choose then to put the indirect retainer into that mesial fossa of the bicuspid. Also, all this surface, the superior surface, will serve as an indirect retention of some magnitude. Now, to simplify the design, I've also placed an indirect retainer here. Now, I could possibly just come way down here and go over and make a, a lingual, a, a reciprocal arm. But I feel that we should connect this, terminate this uh, lingual plate in an indirect retainer on the opposite side. This indirect retainer will uh, not have as much of a primary function in, uh, in, in function in, as this, the other indirect retainer but it will also help to provide a third point of reference. The third point of reference uh, function of the indirect retainer is when the base element loses support, when you have some resorption of the base area and it is depressed, the indirect retainers you see would rise because it is rotating about the distal, uh, the distal primary uh, clusal rest. So, in order to reline the partial and get the partial back in its original position, we would use the indirect retainer in this lingual apron. We would seat this as well as the primary occlusal rests, and that we, then we would place the uh, reline material under the base and seat the framework in that position and then we would get an, uh, the uh, proper relationship of the framework uh, to the existing dentition. Without a third point of reference, 
without the indirect retainers or this apron, we would have no third point of reference and the partial could rock back and forth uh, to any degree uh, that it wanted. So coming around, we do have the indirect retainer. We would terminate it here. And the minor connector, or the major connector, would then continue as a lingual bar. Because as was measured in the mouth, I have an adequate amount of room between the superior surface of this bar and the free gingival margin to provide good clearance and uh, there should be no periodontal uh, problem here because the components are far enough apart. This uh, molar clasp on the abutment tooth, the, this primary unit, will be of a cast metal. We will not use a stress breaking effect on this molar clasp. The molar has a larger tooth, has uh, the root support is more favorable to cast or clasping with a cast clasp. So we have marked the terminal portion or the retentive portion of that clasp with red. That will be the retentive portion. And this portion of the clasp should lie at or above the height of contour. Uh, that we have surveyed. So the molar abutment in this case will then be a cast unit. The bicuspid abutment will be a uh, of wrought of a wrought wire uh, form and the major connector connecting the component parts and serving as the indirect retainer would be a lingual apron covering the cingulum surfaces of the anterior teeth. Now the, the base area should also be outlined on the cast. And I should term this the potential base area because we are going to do a secondary ridge impression in our partial denture technique. So we don't know the final extensions of the base until we do that secondary impression. So looking at the uh, cast again, we have outlined in blue this base coverage. Now the base coverage should cover the retromolar pad area. And we can see this retromolar pad has been distorted by the alginate impression tray, but we can see that the, for adequate coverage for base support, it should be covered. We should, not terminate par we should not terminate partial dentures at the base of the retromolar pad here, but should cover it. And it should go down to the reflecting areas in its connection with the floor of the mouth on the lingual and in the buccal vestibule to its connection here. I would estimate that this base is slightly overextended or is overextended and that when we did the secondary ridge impression, it would not be of the magnitude that it is here. Now this framework will be used to uh, potentially do our treatment planning for the patient. We now see where we will need to prepare uh, rest seats and where we will need to disc uh, or uh, lingual or axial surfaces. And it will also be used as a guide to be sent to the laboratory when the partial denture is going to be waxed up. So every treatment plan uh, and every par partial denture that is constructed should have a design drawn by the dentist sent to the laboratory as an aid in fabricating an, an accurate and functionally good removable partial denture. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.